G'day guys, Mac with the Our Circle, and today, well, today we're going to be talking about tanks and armoured warfare in 30k. Now, why am I talking about something we can't possibly know about? Well, I like tanks. I really do. Uh, and because we've been talking about the Sabre so much lately, and how I think that having so many guns on a tank's a bit silly, and because a lot of people like to defend that by saying, hey, it's a science fiction universe, anything goes... I thought I'd take a look at the practicalities of using tanks in the 41st millennium. Even if it's not true to the law, I thought it'd be a fun exercise to go through. I haven't uh, pre-planned much or rehearsed anything, so I'm doing it all off the cuff. Um, but I've got some ideas, so I'm going to try and flesh them out in this video. Talk about tanks, how they operate, how they're used, commanded, that kind of thing. Uh, a quick layman's guide to tanks, if you will, which is why you're seeing a panther on screen here, a lovely uh, World War II German tank. Very good tank, actually. Uh, and in the background, I have a whole bunch of other tanks which I'll bring in and talk about as we go on, uh, to talk about their role in 30k, that kind of thing, and try and discuss how I think they might work, uh, some practical limitations, what's good, what's bad, what I like, dislike, that kind of thing. So, without any further ado, let's talk about it. So, I've picked a paintbrush here as my little pointer because with a nice bright yellow tip you can see exactly what I'm pointing to. So the Panther tank here, World War II design, I'd love to have had something more modern like a Challenger, Leopard 2 or an Abrams which are our current sort of main battle tanks around the world, uh, maybe a T-90 or a uh, T-80 for the Russians, that sort of thing or anything the Chinese have knocked off this week because as we know they knock off everything from everyone else, there's no original creativity in that military. So, right here, we have the main gun, obviously. In this case, it was a 75mm L43 off the top of my head, uh, 43 being the calibre. The calibre of the weapon is the amount of the bore diameter up the length of a weapon in a tank barrel. In a standard rifle, the calibre of the weapon will be the diameter of the internal bore. Uh, 556, for example, is a common one on rifles, which is 223 in Imperial. Uh, 762, for example, is another common one. NATO and Russia use it, but one's by 39, the other one's by 45 off the top of my head. Anyway, so this is our main barrel here on the tank. Also included in our gun turret, we have a gunner's sight, which will be this one here, I believe, on the Panther. So I'm pretty sure it's a gunner on this side, loader on this side, commander at the back there. Uh, we also have a machine gun built into the mantlet. The mantlet, of course, I'll pull the turret off here. I'll figure out which way the slots line up. Oh, making a fucking fool of myself. There we go. The mantlet is this part here on the front. The mantlet moves with the barrel up and down, provides an armoured shield to the occupants inside the turret. Usually this is the thickest armor on the vehicle that you're looking at. Uh, this one in particular on the Panther, just as a historical note, has a flat part down the bottom here instead of being curved like up the top. That's because it was a shot trap in real life and had to be modified. A shot trap is if this was a curved surface, a round coming in could hit it, hit the curve and ricochet. In this case, down into the very weakly protected top of the tank and the turret ring, which is this part here. On top we also have the commander's coppola, or Francis Ford coppola if you will. This is where he's going to command the vehicle from and we'll also have the pintle mounted machine gun on here, as well as multiple periscopes or viewports around it. And again we'll talk about many of these things when we get to the other heresy tanks. So turret aside, at the back here we have our engine bay. Very weak part of the vehicle. Uh, thinly armoured, obviously has to have big vents for the radiators, uh, and so it was common target for aircraft that were strafing the tanks and, of course, plunging fire from artillery and mortars. On the sides of the tank, we have the sloped plates, and then on the front of the tank, we have the front glacius, or glacius. Uh, just find a nice angle to show the front of the tank. So... On the German tanks, we actually have a driver and a co-driver slash radio operator slash bow machine gunner. This was illuminated from more modern tanks. Uh, 
The Germans preferred to have a frontal drive sprocket on their tanks, which is this here. So this is the actual part that's driving the track. The rest of the wheels are the road wheels on the tank. And on many tanks, uh, we have what you call return rollers, which are the small wheels you often see up the top that are just holding the weight of the track. Now, because these tanks have a frontal transmission, it means that the occupants have to sit above it to some extent because all the drivetrain from the engine has to run through. That meant the Panther's hull was taller than many of its contemporaries, but, you know, nothing crazy. I mean, the Shermans have the same problem. Uh, something like the T-34s, on the other hand, sat much lower. But I've been inside the T-34. Believe me, it is very uncomfortable. I helped restore a T-3485, and um, that's now located in the Bandiana Museum, and I didn't do much of note on it, by the way. So, as I was saying, driver is sitting here. He has his own vision port here, uh, which is a periscope, which he's able to move from side to side. Very thick glass in it, and even if a shot was to get through it, well, it has to go into it and down and then in again to get to the driver because it's a periscope and they work in that manner. Uh, so he's completely fine. It's important to have their own hatches so they can extra, uh, extradite themselves from the vehicle if the vehicle catches fire, which when you have a petroleum fuel tank, not a diesel fuel tank, is a very real possibility. We also have lights and recovery points on the vehicle. Uh, on the German tanks, they also had uh, facilities for mounting plates on the sides because they found that later in the war, uh, the Panthers were taking hits from anti-tank rifles in the sides, which could theoretically penetrate them, and did. So by putting a thin sheet of armour on the side, was able to reinforce it enough in order to prevent that from happening. Uh, so they never went with the Panther II project because of that. Now these are all pretty general points. Uh, in the back of the turret there's also another escape hatch. The problem with a lot of the escape hatches in tanks is they're fucking small. Uh, if something bad does happen to you, uh, you're not going to have much time to get out of the vehicle. And on the Panther, these hatches do clear the mantlet. On many tanks from the British Army, you actually have to have the turret to the side in order for the crew to have enough room to get out. This is obviously really fucking bad for your crew survivability. Uh, and wasn't really solved in the British Army until they got to the Centurion, which is, of course, the world's greatest tank of all time. Yeah, suck on it, T-34, you shit. Now, pros and cons of something like a Panther, of course, you could spend all day going through. But the important thing is, big cupola up on top for the commander, and that you've got this sloped armour. Well, I say sloped armour. Sloped armour has positives and negatives, and we'll talk about that as it becomes relevant. But the big thing is your commander. The commander's job in a tank is everything. It is the hardest job in the tank, uh, even harder than being the poor bastard loading the gun. Because the commander is usually, even in a combat situation, sticking up out the top of the vehicle. Why is this? Because his job is to look around at the battlefield and say, there's all these other tanks that need looking at and targets to be identified, picked out, and destroyed. The gunner knows how to do his job. The loader knows how to do their job. So what the commander will do is tell, and in many vehicles he even has his own ability to traverse the turret, and he'll say, we have a Lehman Russ over in this direction. They'll pivot the turret to point at the Lehman Russ, and then the gunner will do his fine adjustments to take it out. Meanwhile, the commander is already trying to pick out his next target. Or if there's too many targets, he's going to make the decision to get out of there. He's also going to be talking to his radio operator, and in more modern tanks, because we removed this person from the tank, the commander's doing that job as well, he'll be talking to the other tanks he's working with in order to communicate to them. Uh, we have three tanks coming up on the uh, 12 o'clock position, looks like this kind of vehicle, you know, or maybe uh, it's an infantry position, we're going to have to go for a high explosive option, you know, there are many things that come into play. This poor guy is doing a hell of a job up in the top of the tank, the poor commander. And the problem is, even though you've got all these periscopes, the vision is terrible, trust me. Uh, go put your head inside your letterbox. That's what it's like looking out of a tank. Because you can't have big open windows and good vision out of a tank. Because, well, you just can't see anything. You're creating weaknesses by putting holes in the thing. That's why everything has to be so heavily reinforced around vision points and gun ports, that kind of thing. 
Uh, it's why you see this bound machine gun here. It's this big dome. It's a big thick casting they've had to weld into the tank to try and create some more strength uh, and a ball turret around this little tiny little machine gun here. Uh, it's judged to be too much of a weakness going forward into future designs, which is why it's basically removed from tanks. They said either we can use the machine guns up here and here, or we're fucked. So keep that in mind, because now we're going to go into our 40k tanks. Well, 30k tanks. So first things first, let's start with something pretty traditional, which is actually the Lehman Russ. Now you can pretend, in this case, we can get rid of the whole machine gun. So this here is basically the same sort of concept. We have our turret, we have a cupola, we have some sort of vision devices, probably this large site here, some sort of thermal imaging site, possibly the commander's thermal imaging site, uh, this small site here, or possibly that larger one over there, that periscope, could be gunner sites. Can't tell you if they are or aren't, but it's a likely guess that one of them is. So the commander is able to pick his targets and slew the turret around onto the target, and then the gunner will do his job of destroying the target. The commander's going to make sure it's destroyed to some extent, but he's again going to be picking out other targets, figuring out they need to get out of the area, uh, letting higher up know that, hey, we've engaged the enemy, we need to deal with the enemy in some capacity. Uh, if they're working with other vehicles, he's going to say, you know, uh, hold the infantry back perhaps, or keep the armoured personnel carriers out of the way because there's some actual tank engagement going on here. Uh, they could have run into a heavy area of anti-tank firepower, and he might be saying, fuck, we've got to get our own tanks out of here because this is a dangerous area. That's all normal stuff. And of course, we've got our bound machine gunner right here. Now, is the shape of this tank a bad thing? Uh, well, okay, first of all, we have our sloped armour. It could be driving from the front, but this looks like a track tensioner here, so it's probably not going to be attached to a transmission. This wheel back here is most likely the drive sprocket. Now, with this being a track tensioner, does this tank need to be so tall? Well, that depends. You need to fit a lot of crew into this. Not only do you need to fit in crew, but you need to fit in ammunition. Since these are more of a World War II style tank, the ammunition, although this is running a Volkite weapon, is probably going to be stored mostly in the hull because the turret is too small when you compare it to the infantry of the game in order for it to store much ammunition up in here. Therefore, we need a bit more height in order to store the appropriate amount of ammo. On top of that, our main escape and entry hatches on the vehicle are here. If this tank has an accident, there's no way the driver is getting out anywhere here. He may be able to climb out through this frontal door, like on a T-34 tank, but again, having done that on a T-34 tank, it's horrible. Uh, there's a channel, uh, the World of Tanks channel, and the Chieftain even tries on a T-34 and finds it to be quite a difficult task. So we've established we've got escape hatches for the crew. We're talking about why it's high. Does the tracks coming up and over the top, is that a bad thing? Uh, not really. Uh, most tanks... The tracks are coming up to the height of the hull. The thing is, tanks nowadays are a lot shorter because the drivers are laying in a reclined position, not a standard sitting upright position, uh, because the controls allow them to get down lower. The sloped frontal armour. Now, you would get back to this point. A lot of people point out to it being an invention of World War II, the T-34, that kind of thing. Well, the sloped frontal hull armour, it was known about. Renault FT tank from World War I had a very sloped hull, People knew what sloped armour did. The problem is there's a compromise, and the compromise is the more you slope your armour, the less internal volume you now have. Whereas a tank with a big, flat, square front, well, that thing has a lot more volume and a lot more internal space for you to occupy yourself with. Uh, so, whilst, yes, for a thinner amount of armour, you're getting an equivalent protection to a flat surface, you are, of course, taking away internal volume, and... Shots that now land from a more vertical angle are actually going to be more likely to punch through, which means artillery rounds or tank rounds that are fired over a longer range that lob in are going to be hitting a flat surface, whereas a tank round coming in from a long distance and hitting the flat side is actually going to have a harder time penetrating it, unless, of course, the side armour is thinner, because there is a chance of deflection, and also the cross-section is thicker. So that's our William and Russ. Even our armoured personnel carrier, in this case the Aurochs, which is about the size of the Sabre. 
It's another great example. So here is of course our driver and our driver's hatch. Very large hatch and exposed. Uh, probably very thick armor, you'd imagine, but it's also gonna be light enough for the driver to lift, probably with some mechanical assistance, such as a ram, uh, a gas ram that is, uh, not a hydraulic one, or springs. But it's there. So this is where our driver is living and occupying himself, and this up here is our commander's coppola. Now, it doesn't have a good coppola, that's not a problem, because he can just stick his head up out the top anyway, it doesn't matter if he doesn't have periscopes. Uh, he also has some sort of sight unit built in here, which may be some sort of night sight, something like that, but generally the driver will have one of those behind his own uh, periscope anyway. But the same basic principles apply. Driving wheel, probably the back wheel because the track tensioner is up here again. Large side hatch on the vehicle, rear and on top, so the crew can get out in the event of emergency, and of course because it is an armoured personnel carrier. Vindicator. This is where we start to run into some problems. Great design, sort of like something like a Stug, one of these World War II vehicles. One hatch only. <laughs> uh, sure, there is a rear door, but as we're all told, there is no transport capacity in these vehicles because it's full of the capacitors and the ammunition to run them. This is a death trap. Now, the bright side is there's a lot of vision ports for the commander, uh, and a lot of commanders in modern tanks and such have uh, their own commander toggled imaging, thermal imaging sites and such like that. They have their own little external cameras that they can look around with. This vehicle has none. Whilst yes, there is some sort of camera here, it probably has something to do with the sighting system more than anything because it has no way of actually turning. Um, in fact, there's no real way of actually driving this unless you're using these periscopes or this point here because this little window is looking off at 45 degrees. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how this vehicle actually functions. The commanders are probably going to spend their whole day sticking out the top here, looking for the targets they're going to shoot at, and they're going to have a hard time of doing that in this vehicle, especially because the whole vehicle is going to have to slew around onto the target. So, next up, let's look at the Sikoran. Now, the Sikoran is very close to a modern battle tank in many ways. Large sloped armor surfaces is great, uh, probably rear sprocket driven again, it's the better way of doing it. Uh, I dare say these are not driving transmissions, these horns up front, these are probably just reinforcement uh, to help with the suspension, that kind of thing. Of course this type of track design, the hinges are going to take a lot of wear, <laughs> um, probably flog out very quickly on rough ground, but so be it. Uh, whole machine gun, good. Side pintle machine guns, good, uh, most likely operated by an internal gunner um, who's looking through sights, actually mounted on them electronically, doesn't necessarily need to be located in the side here, could be sitting somewhere in the middle of the vehicle. Could be the commander himself who operates them. Commander himself obviously has his cupola on top. There's a huge set of imaging sights at the front here which can be used to acquire targets and slew around onto, and he can look around and pick his next target. Uh, if the gun is directly above the hatch, it is going to create a problem for the vehicle's driver to get out, but mm, it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, of course, if the turret has a basket, it's going to be fucked for the driver to get out uh, if there's no way for him to climb back and through and up the top. So that's not great. Uh, apart from that though, the heavily sloped armour and such on the vehicle is good. This area around here though is a massive shot trap. But we'll talk about if I think it's feasible or not in 40k, the shot traps, uh, later on in the video again. Apart from that, all the other standard functions are there on the tank. Alright, so, next up, the Sikoran Arcus, which is of course the nastiest variant of the Sikoran battle tank. No Commander's Coppola. Hmm, this is a problem. Yes, we have a, quite a few sites here, but they're probably to do with aiming and firing the main missile launchers. The commander is not going to be using the hatch located directly above the driver because the poor driver is probably not going to like having to drive around with the commander on him, and the commander is going to have a hard time slewing the weapon around to face the target if he's in the way. The one redeeming feature, being a missile, it could be an indirectly fired weapon, which means it could be uh, he could pick a target, laser it up, and then 
set and forget. But apart from that, you're yeah, pretty much screwed. Me personally, I've put uh, these Iron Hands covers on the sides, but normally, of course, there would be weapons there. So this is slightly problematic. Now, here is a turret of a Sicarano Omega, and this is even worse because these are not indirect fire. We know these are a type of main battle tank cannon, as it were. Um, there is nothing in this turret apart from a poor gunner, I'm guessing, in this top hatch up here, who's able to look out the little viewport to spot things. Uh, if this is the commander, there is no lateral vision. Nothing sideways. Your own weapons are blocking it. Uh, the glare of the glowing plasma is probably also going to be a problem for you. Uh, the heat coming off them is probably also going to be a problem for any thermal imaging sites here. So basically, this turret is a fucking shambles. Uh, even with futuristic technology, uh, I hate to say, because again, something like a thermal sites, even if they've got really advanced in the future, are going to have a hard problem uh, with picking out targets at a distance when there's so much background heat of a much higher intensity right next to the actual source. So let's pretend uh, the Omega doesn't exist, uh, mostly because of its rules as well, which are absolutely terrible. Uh, the last tank in this little collection here is this uh, Land Raider, which I've lovingly converted out of a uh, Proteus into an Achilles. It's a Land Raider Proteus, rear half, sides, and the front half is a 40k Land Raider Achilles. Uh, the actual seam is right through the middle, just for the record. Pretty power out of it, uh, not gonna lie. Sliced right through there. And I put the cupola on top, which is the way the commander sits. And this is how a commander will usually spend a battle in a tank. He'll actually be out the top. Obviously, he won't be uh, sticking with his entire legs out. It'll probably just be his head looking out the top. But of course, I've put him this way so we can actually see over the top of his tracks and have some vision. Now, this vehicle, we've got a Pintle weapon up here. This is a weapon that is operated by him exclusive to the rest of the tank. This is not to be confused with, say, the Sabre, which has a secondary hull weapon mounted above the primary main gun, which is not the Pintle weapon. Pintle weapons are not supplied in this Sabre kit. Now, in the Land Raider, you have a larger crew, and of course, in this vehicle with the artillery cannon, there is a cut down on the transport capacity. But we still have a driver, we definitely still have a commander, and we must have some sort of gunner. The only assumption I will make about 40k vehicles that I'm very certain of is that the gunner, most probably, doesn't have a loader. Everything is auto-loading, and that makes perfect uh, sense. There are, of course, downsides and uh, such to having an auto loader, but let's assume they've worked out all the downsides and uh, the chances of them breaking down is really minute in 40k and 30k, so it's not really an issue that you don't have a human loading. The side weapons, yeah, maybe they could have some sort of machine spirit, um, but I imagine they're most likely fired by someone like the commander when he's in a hold down position and they're facing an incoming infantry attack and something like the main battle cannon on the vehicle is no longer of any use. Uh, again, probably not a front transmission because it has these large hubs here. Uh, I'm not seeing any visible transmission. I dare say the the actual large rear wheel here is our driving wheel. Uh, could be wrong on the Proteus, but that to me makes the most logical sense. Apart from that, sloped front, big escape hatches, and of course the commander's hatch on top. Yeah, this is this is actually a kind of good design. Obviously, you don't want your tracks going this high if you don't need them to, but you could argue that they're only this high in order to give enough room for the return rollers, suspension, uh, and space for the actual hatch to fit in physically so that Marines don't have to, you know, squeeze themselves in a little ball to get out. So, applying the concepts of modern tank warfare to 40K and 30K, Think about the Sabre tank. This vehicle here, which is gonna, we're gonna pretend it's a Sabre. Let's pretend this little point here with the little, uh, little uh, window. Uh, there is some kind of weapon, some sort of gun. We're going to represent it with this bit of blue tack that's just sitting right here, which I'm just picking up because it's there. There we go. There is our gun. Absolutely perfect. Uh, 10 out of 10 sculpt by me, uh, going on sale next week in China. So. Our poor guy is driving the tank here, and this hatch above him is his exit and entry hatch in the Sabre. It's directly above 
the canopy. He also has a full vision cupola, very similar to the one off the Sicarian turret here, the Sicarian turret with lots of windows around it. That's fine. Uh, he's probably not going to use it too much. If he's trying to turn sideways or such, yes. Um, the drivers have terrible vision in general. They usually will just open the hatch and stick their head clean out. And if they're going into combat, well, you don't really want to be doing that, especially if you're the sole occupant of your vehicle. And this is where things become problematic because the sole occupant of your vehicle in a hull down position, you've got only this tiny little window here. And yeah, okay, you may have some periscopes on top, but they're not too much help to you in combat because you're not going to get too great a vision out of them. Again, your world is the size of a letterbox slot. It is not much to look out of. And if you're on the move at the same time, because it is a fast vehicle and you try and look out of them, you're going to have a hard time of it. This vehicle is going to have a hard time prioritizing targets. Okay, in theory, if you're performing a stug roll, like uh, this Vindicator here, you could sit still in ambush and wait for the enemy. But these tanks are fast. They're not designed to be a stug roll. And they're the same size, practically. So there's not much gain here. Uh, you're having to pick your target, slew your target around, aim at the target, fire at the target, and pick your next target. And you're doing it all on your own with no visibility. And you've also got to be the guy who's doing all the communication, not only with your... Uh, well, you have no crew, but not only with your fellow tanks working around you, but also with your higher-ups in the rear who want to know what is going on in the battle. Uh, at this time, do we? how many enemies are you facing? Do we need to bring more troops in? Have we made a breakthrough? These kind of questions are coming through from command. The, the commander always wants to know what the fuck is going on. Trust me, you get a lot of questions if you're in charge of a group of soldiers. I can tell you this from my days. Uh, and so this uh, vehicle right here is compromised from a design point of view because of that. Now, make it a two-man tank, a reconnaissance vehicle like a Scorpion, that kind of thing. You could say that there's a guy driving in the front and then this hatch just behind, which is much closer on the actual Sabre model. But in this hatch close behind is where the commander is. He's picking out the targets, slewing the weapon around, that kind of thing. Uh, and the driver is helping him in this task by moving the vehicle to help aim the weapon. And possibly even the driver is firing it while the commander is picking out new targets, passing information down the line. These are important reasons why I don't think the Sabre design would work. Now, scientific, science fiction, uh, universe where magic and such exists. And because people like to use that answer as an excuse for everything, I will say this. If nothing matters because something like the warp exists and it's all sci-fi mumbo jumbo, uh, then why not have... Uh, space Jesus riding on a purple unicorn, which is half dinosaur, and redeem uh, Horus's soul from nothingness and bring the Emperor back to life. If nothing makes sense, there are no rules. Well, unfortunately, this does make sense. And the limitations of a human, even a superhuman, are still there. You can only target what you can see, and your vision is limited to what vision aids you have available. And if you only have windows to look out of, you are greatly limited. Now, if you're willing to say your Marine is sticking at the top, firing the hull-mounted weapon, firing the secondary hull-mounted weapon, firing his pintle machine gun with one hand at the same time, and firing his four rocket launchers off the sides at once, that's fine. I think it's implausible on the Sabre tank, which is why, realistically, I'd do away with the four side-mounted missile launchers. Uh, and keep it to just the two hull mounted weapons and get rid of a pintle weapon altogether because you've got crew demands. How much are you expecting this poor bastard to do? Um, can we all agree that he is still a human, even a marine with superhuman reflexes, better sight, hearing, all that kind of thing? He's still slightly limited by the fact he's only got two arms, he's only got two legs, and he's only got one head. And yes, there may be a machine spirit in there to help him out. I don't know, but if you can replace the crew members in something as small as a Sabre, uh, which our standing Aurochs, of course, is representing, with uh, all this kind of thing, then why do any of these tanks here not just do that? Have machine spirits fire everything. You don't need these complicated sighting systems and all these viewports. Just, you know, have a computer do it all. Well, unfortunately, in this universe, they've rationalized it by saying, hey, that's not how computers work. We just don't have enough of them, they're not reliable enough, that kind of thing. So, out of all of these, funny enough, the design that probably works best 
it's not even us, which is crazy to think about. And again, we've probably got auto loading systems in our tanks. Uh, ammunition could be very different to how it is today. Probably auto caseless ammunition, you'd be guessing. I don't think, looking at the designs, they're that much more advanced than designs of today. Uh, people say this is a sci-fi setting. I can only see them being maybe a couple hundred years at most more advanced than what we are now. Now, you can do a lot of advancement in a couple of hundred years. Um, but because there's been so many rises and falls uh, for humanity in the time period, I imagine that most likely the uh, vehicles of 40k are just sort of primitive because they kind of are. They're the best advanced tanks we can throw together with the resources and knowledge left over after all the bad things that have happened. And so that's the situation we're in. The sort of sights I imagine we'd see, well, you're basically be seeing in every visual spectrum. Thermal imaging, ultraviolet imaging, uh, infrared, uh, which, well, it's thermal imaging, uh, enhanced light amplification imaging, that sort of thing, would all be available to these vehicles, obviously, plus Marines can see outside of the normal human spectrum anyway. So these are all uh, aids that are there. Of course, although the vehicles don't represent it at all, uh, well, you kind of have it on the Vindicator, you can have external camera systems mounted on the vehicle. Uh, we use them today that are able to look around independently and we mount them on things like our uh, pintle weapons. And as you can see on the Vindicator, we actually have a small sight independently built into the combi bolter on top. That's true to life. We have that on modern vehicles today in the military that are able to look around uh, separate. Of course, the downside is you're looking through a very narrow, uh, limited window. Uh, think of it like real life. Yes, you're covered in windows and there's all these cameras that may be mounted around the vehicle that you can look out of, but uh, at the end of the day, it's restrictive. And if you think of it as uh, when you play a video game, play something like Call of Duty, what is your awareness of your surroundings? How limited is it? It's limited to that screen in front of you. But if you were to hold a rifle in re real life, everyone's probably held a water pistol or something like that or a Nerf gun. Think of how much more aware of what uh, is going on around you you are with your own senses. Well, it's the same sort of thing. When you're in a vehicle, you're artificially restricting your senses because of these windows, because of the sighting systems, all that. You have way less awareness than you otherwise would. Now, of course, you could say something like thermals is giving you more awareness, but that's sort of neither here nor there because, well, you may be able to see more in the dark than you could before, but if you're not pointing at the thing you need to see, then you're not seeing anything anyway. That's the downsides of it. Um, apart from that, I like the designs and I just thought it would be fun today to go through, you know, the different roles of these vehicles, how they would actually apply on the battlefield. Of course, um, the reason why a lot of tanks went away from these limited traverse mountings, apart from maybe the Stridsvagen out of uh, Sweden, is because they're dog shit. <laughs> uh, the gun takes up too much space inside the vehicles. The crew have to cramp around and move around them in funny ways. Uh, especially if they're pointing backwards on the tank uh, because the driver has to reverse the tanks in the position. Makes it easier to drive off, of course. Uh, but in order to traverse the gun, you have to move the whole tank. And tanks are noisy things to move. Uh, and also, they don't move very finely. It's very hard to do fine adjustments sideways, which means that they do have some minimal sideways traverse built in on most gun turrets, but it's really pathetic the amount they can actually turn. They're the fine adjustment. You slew around as your major adjustment and you do a fine one to get on target. By having a turret, you obviously eliminate all these problems, which is why turrets are on every fucking tank. They're just so good. The Stridsvagen is the exception to the rule, the Swedish S-Tank, because that thing is an ambush predator afraid of Soviets at the time, and I guess the normal Russians, Vladimir Putin riding grizzly bears or something. Uh, running over the border at them, they can afford to sit still. Fantastic for defensive warfare. Um, but they built a very fine mechanism in for turning the hull very minimal amounts. Uh, but again, that's not really the norm. So, that's my brief overview of tank warfare, parts of the tank, that kind of thing. The pros and cons of sloped armour. Uh, the one other thing that maybe I could talk about quickly before we finish up is... The realities of armoured warfare and shot traps. So again, like I pointed out in the Panther, something could hit and glance off into somewhere important and destroy it, penetrate the tank, kill the occupants. Very bad news. 
we don't want something to hit, glance, kill. In 40k, you're going to assume, and I'm going to assume, most weapons have gotten to the point where they're just so damn powerful, they'll punch through the armor of anything. Unless it's just incredibly thickly armored. And that's how I view things like the Predator. What are people going, why is the Predator a main battle tank? I think, hey, they probably went, an armored personnel carrier with a turret is just as effective as a tank purpose built to be a tank when it comes to taking the impact of enemy rounds because uh, the ballistics of weapons is just so fucking advanced in the future. Uh, anything, even man portable weapons can punch through the heaviest of armor on even something like a land raider. Therefore, you give your crew enough to keep them safe from the ordinary weapons, your bolt guns, your las guns, even some of the weaker missiles, sure. You give them what they need to get through that. But at the end of the day, things like las cannons are going through anything like butter, even your mastodons, your titans, that kind of thing. So there's obviously an upper practical limit to armor. Therefore, it doesn't really matter if you've got a shot trap in a world where everything can penetrate everything. And that's the way I kind of view it. The tank engagements are taking place at short range because I'm just going to assume that prior to the battle starting, the tanks and such had a long distance duel that you didn't see off camera. And now this is the final closing moments of the engagement, something like that. That's my rationale behind it. Why things are taking place at uh, point blank range. Uh, and yeah, anyway. Back with the Outer Circle, hope you all found this informative to some level. Uh, maybe you did know a heap about tanks, maybe you know nothing about them. Maybe you've served in them and you can elaborate further on some of my points, like how bloody hard a tank commander's job actually is, uh, and just how important vision around you is in a battle. It is key and it will win and lose you battles. A uh, great example of this is France falling to Germany in 1940. The French commanders were good at their job, but they had to do everything on their own in the turrets, pretty much. They were aiming the tanks, they were loading the tanks, they had to stick their head out of a terrible cupola on top, or actually there was a hatch in the back of the turret. Uh, they couldn't see shit. They had to do all these jobs. They also had to operate the radio. The Germans, meanwhile, rock up in their tanks, which were probably inferior to many French designs at the time, because you're only talking, at best, pairs of threes and fours in very limited numbers. And they have full vision for the commanders. They've got individual guys for individual tasks in the tank. All this great stuff. The French couldn't do it. Using your commander appropriately in tanks can't be elaborated on enough uh, or exaggerated enough. And frankly, many tanks, especially the Sabre, which I keep pointing to my Aurochs to represent, it does a terrible job of it. And I don't see that operator firing all seven weapons that vehicle potentially can take. Well. Anyway. Mac with the Outer Circle, thank you all for watching this very interesting, I hope, episode, and I'll see you all next time.